Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, EuroBSDCon is very, very happy to uh, have Stefan Sperling uh, this afternoon talking about uh, Game of Trees. Uh, hopefully, the uh, ending will be better than uh, Game of Thrones. Um, quick note, um, this is going to be a rather long talk, so there won't probably be time for a Q&A session. So if you need to ask uh, Stefan some questions, don't hesitate to kidnap him uh, uh, after the talk. All right? Have fun. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks. Thanks. Can you hear me? Okay, good. So this um, is, oops, it could have been one slide too far. All right. So Game of Trees tries to be a version control system that is appealing to OpenBSD developers in, sp uh, in particular. Um, not just at the functional level, but also in the implementation and the coding style and the design and the architecture of the whole thing. Uh, the license is ISC, and for various reasons, it's compatible with uh, Git repositories. And um, also, we try to have nice man pages that are easy to follow. There's a couple of people that have uh, had input into this project. It's not just me, even though it might appear to be that way, but there's actually quite a few people I've had discussions with, and this extends beyond OpenBSD's community as well, because you'll see it, the, the former and the current libgit2 maintainer on this slide. We work together at a company, and um, so they helped me a lot. Now, this is the overview of the general design. You have uh, currently, there are two front-end applications. One is the command line tool, GOT, and the other one is a graphical and cursor-based uh, browser called TOG. And you have a library which contains most of the version, call version control machinery you would expect, like you can handle objects, uh, cache them, you have differences between objects, you have um, code to manage a work tree, and all the sorts of stuff. And what's uh, unique about the design in this case is the arrow that is labeled fork and exec, because when we read Git repositories, we don't assume that they are a trusted source of information, but they are copied from somewhere on the internet, and we are scared of being exploited and stuff, so it might be useful to wrap the, these accesses in a different address space with uh, different utilities that then run in a separate process context. And that's how we read data to the, from the repository. When we write to the repository, we just do it directly. There is, um, for Git users, this is probably surprising, we don't use the actual Git work tree that Git maintains in its repository, so usually you'd have the work tree and the .git folder, but here we just ignore the files above the .git folder, because we don't care about those. This has some advantages, for example, it allows you to really operate with both tools on the same, on the same object, which is kind of neat. It also allows God to be a little bit different in the sense that, um, it really only requires you to keep one copy of the repository on a, on a local disk, and you can create as many work trees as you want from it, and you can also check out subtrees from those work trees. So you could have, say, a user source checked out from it, you could have your couple of kernels checked out, or some user land utilities like tmux, put them somewhere separately and work on them. The work tree remembers um, the path of the repository, it remembers the branch it's on, so there's a sticky branch for the entire work tree, and it also um, remembers the commit that was checked out from this branch. And the commits are checked per file. They're not like, usually you think of it as a global thing, but this tool is actually able to pull files from different commits, just like Git would be if you ask it to. This is the pledge promises that we're using currently. Uh, there is no network access yet, so you don't have INET and DNS in here. Those would, of course, have to be added in case uh, network support is implemented. But um, the helpers that actually read data, they have a very limited um, exposure to system calls. So they can really only do things like MMAP, and they take file descriptors um, for, for reading data and file descriptors for outputting data. And uh, so if an attacker uh, gets in there, they can't really do a lot at the system call level. We also use Unveil, where we limit the application to the paths it is actually needing. So, of course, the repository needs to be read, the work tree needs to be read, the slash temp directory is used, and um, 
Also, if you import unversion files into the repository, we need to read those, of course. Um, when you type a commit message, uh, unveil is not yet applied at this point because unveil is supposed to extend uh, from one process to another through exec and fork. Um, this is actually not currently the case in the implementation, but the design of unveil is supposed to make that happen eventually, so we can't really uh, use unveil before the editor is done, because the editor might read its own configuration files, load shed libraries, and all sorts of stuff that we can't control. So for the, for the commit command, you get unveil protection as soon as you're done writing your log message. We also read the git config file, but only to uh, get um, user and author uh, username email information that you might want to use just for default values. You can overwrite those separately. And this is the any parser uh, is, is used for, to read this file, and it runs in a separate process as well. Uh, since I talked to Martin about this uh, last night, um, he asked me what are the helpers, and I realized I didn't have a slide for this, so this is the list. Um, you have the object reader is basically just reading the header, so in case we only want to know the ID and the size or something like that, we use that. And then you have uh, readers for the different object types, which are parsing the loose objects that are in the file system. And then you have a reader for packed files where objects can be extracted from, and you have a reader for the git config file. I'm going to explain some git basics. So in case people know git already, the following few slides will might contain old information, but we're trying to keep this short. So Git has several object types. Um, the blobs con the bottom store file content, pretty much as is. The tree objects are essentially directory inodes in this virtual file system tree, and the commit objects um, point at one particular tree uh, to create a snapshot of your project, and then you can chain those commit objects to create basically versions of your project as a chain of snapshots. You also have tag objects, which allow you to label commits as released versions. That's pretty much the, the simple data model. On disk, uh, objects are often stored in loose form, as it's called, when you create them, which means each object has a separate file on disk named after its ID. And this ID is derived from its content, so you have a type header, a size header, and then the data, and this all is hashed, currently with SHA-1, though Git might change that at some point, and um, after hashing, you also compress the data with Clib and write out the file. And that's basically how you create an object in the repository. Now, this could be very inefficient because, of course, you don't want to have thousands of, of objects lying around on disk and using up inodes and things, so um, Git invented a pack file format, which is pretty neat, actually, because while many version control systems will usually deltify between versions of individual files, like CVS does, for example. This allows you to deltify across entire collections of files. And so, for example, if the license header is the same in all of them, the delta algorithm can use, see that, and it can basically build layers of deltas to construct files and be really space efficient when it's saving things. And to do this, they added two object types in pack files, which only occur there. One of the is a delta object um, with an offset that tells you where in the pack file the other object is that you need to read to apply the delta on top of. And the other one is a delta which refers to its base by the, by the SHA-1 ID of the object. Um, you also have a pack index, which is stored in a separate file, and that allows you to, to know where the objects are. But basically, it's just a list of IDs and offsets into the pack file. On disk, it looks like this. You have the pack index, and you have the pack file, and this is a whole source tree that I, that I packed. It's a gig of storage, which is a lot more efficient than CVS. And the pack files are also used in Git uh, for communication purposes. So when you send a collection of objects between servers, uh, they will usually be packed in a pack file. So you use the same space efficiency to, get, uh, to limit the amount of network traffic that's being sent around. Git also has a concept of references, which allows you to basically apply user-defined labels or names to particular objects. Generally, it's just a mapping from a string to, an, to a SHA-1 ID or from a string to another reference. And mostly, you use those to identify your branches, because when you have a reference to a commit object, that you can interpret that as a head of a branch. And references have... The names are strings, but they look like file system paths in a way. 
and they always start with refs. And then you have several categories. You have the heads for the branch heads. You have tags to find uh, the tag object. And remotes contains multiple directories, one per remote repository that your repository knows about, and contains copies of the history that exists in those repositories. And uh, Game of Trees internally uses references for a couple of things and stores those in the, in the ref Scott namespace. When you use it on the command line, you don't have to type refs heads, refs tags, and so on all the time. You can just provide a name, and it will be looked up in the given order there. Um, and to disambiguate, you can just use the full name. OK, does anybody, uh, does Henning still have questions? <laughs> no? OK. You're good? You can go on? Fine. So this interface that, that was built for this um, isn't like a very new invention. It's just a combination of things that I happen to, to like and version control systems that I use. And I use all of the ones that are there on the slide, and I also use Fossil. And I've basically, because I've been working on SVN for many years, um, I have to sort of understand what everyone else is doing, and so I have a fairly broad idea of, of how people have implemented all these operations that version control systems do. And so I thought about what would I like to see when I'm working with a Git repository and started to, to just implement it bit by bit. And I also wanted to make sure that I only write code that's actually going to be used by OpenBSD developers, and I don't want to add features that they won't need. So um, this saves time, and it also keeps the sim interface simpler. I also made sure that I don't use um, long options, so you only have single letter options. I also kept the amount of options at a minimum, so you only have the options you absolutely need. And you end up with a list like this for local version control operations. Um, you can maybe look over this and see if you find your favorite commands there or not. And um, in particular, though, you should not assume that any of these do whatever they do in the version control systems you're already used to. Because they produce, let's say, a different way of consistency that doesn't exist elsewhere yet. Every sort of tool has their own way of making things consistent, and this is just consistent in a different way. This is a small example project that we're going to use. So I just want to show you the interface for a bit so we can just walk through some of the operations. So you see it's a Hello World project with a makefile and a readme. You would start off by creating a new repository. Of course, you can also use Git to clone one and operate on that. That's possible. Uh, but for just playing around with it, this is the easy way to start. So we create a repository, and we import files in, from a temporary directory into it. And two things happen here. Um, well, the files get added, obviously. It writes objects, as we just, in the way we've just seen. And it creates two things. It creates the commit hash that you then use as the first commit in your entire line of history. So this commit has no parents. It's a root commit. And also, it creates a branch for you. Because in Game of Trees, you cannot work on anything unless it's on a branch. And because the work trees have to know which branch they're on. And it also creates a head reference, but that's mostly for Git so that Git knows what's going on. Um, we only use the head reference as a default reference if you, don't, if you don't specify one. And so after an import, the repository looks like this. It has the head reference, the master reference, and the objects in the tree as discussed before. And then to actually do work on this, because we don't have a work tree yet, we just have this bare Git repository on the disk, you do a checkout, and you get that creates a work tree. And this can be placed anywhere, and you can create as many as you want. And, each, uh, and you can also um, check out the same work tree from the same branch many times, which is something that Git makes hard to do. Then you do some changes. You can view your changes with status. Um, you can use a diff tool to look at diff command to uh, see the changes you've made. And this is a lot of boilerplate text, and I had some some diffs on the future slides just omit all this context. So we, but you can nicely see that it presents you all the IDs involved in the diff, so you know what's been diffed. And to commit, you use the commit command, and you create commits with that. 
Of course, I'm writing the full name of each command here, but they also have short aliases to make it easier to type them, but these aliases are not flexible. You cannot use or define them because I don't want people to go off and redesign the interface to their liking because I want people to be able to communicate amongst each other how to use the tool. And that only works if everyone speaks the same language, so no configurable aliases here. So once we have a commit, um, basically this is a... Um, the same diagram again, except you don't see the tree of the first commit, which still exists, but you see a new tree, and you see how the commits are linked, and you see that the master reference has moved up. You can also discard your local changes, of course, and for that, like in SVM, you'd use the revert command, which is destructive and really deletes things you've written, so you have to be careful when using it. Um, and you can also use this to um, pick individual changes from files, which is something that SVN does not offer, uh, but Git does. So basically for Git users, this is the equivalent of checkout-p. So if you have two changes in the file, you can run revert-p, you can individually select the changes that you want and say yes or no for each of them. So here we say no because we like daffodils, and here we say yes because we don't like syntax errors. And after that, the file looks like this, and we can commit it. And so this actually happened because JCS told me he often uses Git where he fixes a bug and he adds lots of debug printouts to code. And eventually he fixes the bug in a small section of the file. And then he has to go through and remove all these debug printouts again. And there's a couple of ways of, of um, then committing only that change you actually want. Um, and one of these is to just revert all the changes you don't want. And so you can go through this interactively. You don't have to like open the file in an editor, search for the printouts, you just go through them. Though because revert is destructive, you currently have to be careful what you do at this prompt because the change will be lost. Um, I'm thinking that maybe that's not such a great idea and that we should produce a backup in that case, but that's an implementation detail. Um, another example of how things are done here is that um, when you back out the change that's already committed, it's again modeled a bit on subversion, so you, um, you need a work tree which is at the latest head of the branch which contained the bad change. And you might already have local changes in there. We don't care about that. But this work tree will carry the changes that you're undoing, which basically means you apply the inverse diff of a commit that was already committed in history. And the command for this is called backout, and you just give it the ID, which, as you can see here, can be abbreviated. And then it just merges the change, and you have the change in your Nobody working copy like this. Huh? Nobody will ever need that. I think I've backed out some disks before. <laughs> um, OK, let's talk about branches a bit. So we know that um, in OpenBSD, we don't really use branches. What we do to some extent, we have stable branches for releases. And we uh, specifically switched the purpose of the head um, into release mode ahead of release, which could also be considered a form of a branch. It's just that we do it on the same on the same uh, set of files, we just declare that the purpose of this branch has now changed. But for, we still have stable branches, and also we have some, uh, some vendor branches in the code tree uh, to import things like LLVM and things like this. But now, for now, just keep in mind that we have references, and they point at commits, and that's what a branch is, is modeled as. Uh, what you cannot do yet in Game of Trees is you cannot create merge commits because I haven't yet found a way where I need this for my own workflow against the OpenBSD source tree. Uh, it could eventually be added, but I would discourage its use and confine it to very um, few areas, such as vendor branches, um, because um, we want a linear history that's easy to, to understand, even for external consumers. Um, and having, having lots of branches in the project would just, would just make progress harder for us. So currently, there's no way of doing this. It would be easy to add. It wouldn't be a problem. There's already code to do, to do it in theory. It would just have to be added as a front end. Um, to create a branch in Game of Trees, you use a branch command. You give a name. By default, it uses the current branch you own as the base. And then you can list your branches, and you see that another one has appeared. Now, what all, all this did was really just create a reference. It didn't change your work tree in any way. It just added the second reference to this commit. and. Um, I just said that we don't really use branches in OpenBSD, so why are we creating a branch now? Um, the problem is that in this data model, you cannot see 
changes other people have made before you copy them to your repository. So you need to store those changes somewhere before you can even see them, let alone merge them. So you need a space, some reference um, that says, this is what happened elsewhere, and this is what happened locally. And you need to have that. So normally, uh, ideally in a networked version of this, you would store it under remotes somewhere. But it's really just a name. I mean, you know, you just decide that some references, some represent external state, and some references represent your local branches, and then that's that. And so for this example, um, we can pretend that the master branch is the remote state, and the hiking branch is our local state. And to switch a work tree between branches, you use the update command with the dash B flag. Normally, update would not allow you to switch branches. It would only move you up and down in the same branch. But with dash B, you can say, yes, I want to change the branch. Please reassociate this work tree with a different one. And then nothing happens really because the hashes are the same of both of the branches, but the metadata has been updated. So now we commit two changes that are related to hiking somewhat. And we end up with a repository structure that looks like this. So hiking has moved up, and master is still at the old commit that we started at. So now someone else, somewhere in the world, makes another change. If you try this locally, just get a second work tree, commit to the master branch. It's just essentially the same situation. And you end up like this. So now you have two branches, and they have diverged. They have a common ancestor commit. And you have two references that look at, um, look at diverged history. So now what's important here is that because we ex consider the master branch to be an external branch, it's basically part of the official public history that the project has produced, right? And our hiking branch are local changes that, that only we see. Um, because we, we're not allowed to change commit IDs of things that are already, already declared part of official history upstream, we cannot change the IDs of things on the master branch. So, so 33AB and 349D are fixed. We cannot change them. Um, however, the other commits can change. And uh, since the hashing of Git um, runs through the entire trail of objects that reference each other, um, these hashes will change if we change um, the base of these commits. But we have to do that in order to keep linear, uh, history linear. So if you want to make history linear again, we have to take those two commits on the hiking branch and move them up to the current head of the master. And that's called rebasing. And this is basically how you merge your local changes with the incoming changes in this tool. So to rebase, you need, uh, again, a work tree. And this time, this work tree comes from commit 33AB. And it's on the master branch. Because that's where we want to rebase hiking on top of. So we basically we, we get the, the base that we want this history to be applied onto. And we're not allowed to have any local changes in this work tree, because that just avoids unnecessary merge conflicts. Then Game of Trees will internally switch this work to a temporary branch and apply the commits that you've made before on top of the new base. And once all that is done and has succeeded, it will take this temporary branch, and this one becomes the new hiking branch. And the old hiking branch basically just sits there in the repository and can be garbage collected at some point, which is not yet implemented. So you could run git gc or something like this to really delete it. But it's not really important. Um, so this looks, in the user interface, it looks like this. You switch back to the master branch, and you say, uh, hi rebase the hiking branch, please. And then you get conflicts, of course, as usual. Now, the conflicts look as you would expect. And um, you know, in the status command, you would see a C for this file, because it contains conflict markers. So there's a couple of ways version control systems have done this. Um, some have special conflict metadata that says, like, this file was in conflict, and you have to run a command to clear this flag so that you may commit it. In this tool, it simply looks for these conflict markers, and if they're still present, you cannot commit. Once you remove them or change them even, it allows you to commit them. Um, I wanted to briefly explain, I think we have enough time still, 
um, that how this merge is actually done. How do we, why do we get this conflict and why do we get this output that we see? Because I've seen a lot of people actually using these tools but never really understanding how the merge conflicts come about and always complaining that merge conflicts happen. And, and it's all magic and not really clear how it's happening. So there's a simple way to, to, to represent or to, to communicate the idea of how diff3 actually works. So with diff3, you get three files as input. And in our case, um, there's an original file, which is the one that was in the commit at the very bottom of the shared history of the branches as we seen, saw them before. So maybe I go back until you see this. So the, the base comes from, the original comes from commit 3490. That's where we take one file from. The other two files are on the tips of each branch. So then we call these files A and B. And um, you can imagine here that every number represents a line of text in a file. It's just to, to, easy, easier, to make it easier to visualize the, how, the, how the algorithm works. So what it does it is compares the original file to A, derived file number A, and, and again, the original file to the derived file B. It never compares A and B directly. And it marks the, the regions where each of these files differ from the original, and if, they, if these regions don't overlap, it just produces the output below. And basically takes the sections that the files wanted to change. And in this case, the merge says it's all good. Uh, whether this still compiles and actually works is a different question. This is not the responsibility of diff3, but diff3 produces a merge version that, that um, corresponds to this algorithm. If you do this with different inputs, so for instance, uh, A, B like this, you would um, mar end up marking overlapping sections. And in that case, the algorithm can't decide what to do. It has two versions of, of changes that, um, don't, uh, that are not the same on either side. So it has to offer you both possibilities. And that's, that's why you see these conflict markers in the output. What's perhaps a bit confusing is that you don't ever see the original file on this output. Um, Subversion has started actually to, to show it a few releases ago. So now we, there we produce uh, four-way output or three-way output for our actual diff3 results, and some users have responded to that very positively, so I haven't yet decided whether Game of Trees should do the same, but it's an option. Anyway, if you want to know more about diff3, there's this fantastic paper which also explains the algorithm and with these um, a -B, o -A -B, uh tables and uh, has a lot more details. Now, we've uh, fixed the conflict. Basically, the resolution is arbitrary. It depends on what the programmer really wants, and we say, please continue rebasing. Now we create a new commit that has, we see the old and new ID of this commit that's been rebased, but again, we have a conflict, so we have to do this all over again. And this time we see that, oh yeah, we added a second line in, in our branch, and we also have to, have to merge that. So generally, you don't really get conflicts all the time like this, but because of these toy examples I'm using, of course, they, they occur. I've managed um, wireless changes with like 140 commits on top of OpenBSD master, and it's fine. It, it, it's not a burden. Um, so then we fix this uh, up and maybe even add other context uh, or changes, whatever, the tool doesn't care. And we just say, okay, we're done with resolving this conflict. And now there's two new commits. Our work tree is called on the, on the hiking branch, uh, it's on the hiking branch again, but this time it's the new version of the hiking branch, which is uh, rebased. So now again, we have a linear chain of commits in the repository and everything is good. You can look at those in detail with the log-p command and you see the log messages, the date, author information, and the changes that were actually committed. Um, so what's nice about this tool is that compared to CVS, it gives you actual change sets across several files and everything. And uh, this really helps me also just uh, looking through, basically I stop pretty much following the commit mailing list and I just update my Git repository and browse it to see what people have been working on. It's pretty neat. The browser, oh no, where we are here? No, this is a different one. Okay, so um, people have requested features. So I was basically done at that point with the feature set. That was all I really needed, apart from adding, removing files and things like that. Um, you can also stage changes for commit. 
And uh, contrary to Git, in this tool, staging is entirely optional, so you don't have to use it. You can just run commit, and it will always commit everything that's in the work tree. Um, but if you have staged changes, the commit and diff commands and status commands change their behavior accordingly and only show you either staged or unstaged changes, depending on what you ask for. And commit will never allow you to commit unstaged changes if you already have something staged. You also cannot update files which have staged changes. And um, if you run into a problem there where you're behind your, the head of the branch and you want to commit but can't, you have to actually unstage your changes, which means you merge them back into the work tree, and then update and then stage again if you like. Then there's a hist edit command, which is like what Git calls interactive rebase, and it allows you to reorder commits, change them, merge them, and uh, edit log messages and all this kind of stuff. And this should, of course, only be done with your local history. But this is um, a great way of preparing just for review, um, throwing out unneeded changes um, that you weren't really sure whether you needed them or not, and just commit it, and all this sort of stuff. So this is, um, those two um, features combined allow you to manage your diffs pretty well. There's a browser uh, talk which uh, allows you to browse commits, diff, uh, view diffs, um, annotate files, and uh, uh, read the tree of the repository, browse it. And I wrote this mostly because um, it's a really, really nice way of prototyping the needed functionality. So this actually started very early on before it could read all, this, all the objects. I already had some interface for this. And um, it allowed me to verify quickly that my code was doing the right thing. And I already had a user, uh, which is MPI, who used this tool a lot to dig through history and learn about how the network stack works in old versions of PSC and things like that. So he was using a tool called TIG before that, and which is also OK, but based on Git. And this is basically the equivalent, but written in C and is faster, actually, even though it's prefset. Um, so how did this start? Um, actually, the roots of this whole thing go back to EuroBSD Con in Paris, where a surprising number of people started talking about Git for some reason in the hallway at dinners and things like this. And when I was present, uh, people looked at me and said, well, you know version control, so can you give input? And um, yeah, so we ended up, I ended up thinking, well, it seems like a couple of people are interested in this and I can help. And, I invited uh, Carlos, who's um, at GitHub now, and he's a libgit2 maintainer, uh, to a hackathon where he uh, showed up in an afternoon, and we went to the back room, let everyone hack on their port stuff. Um, but a couple of us went back with Carlos to discuss how realistic such a project would be and what the pitfalls would be. And we just basically, people just threw in their opinions and their ideas, and uh, we discussed them, and, and he basically vetted them against his own understanding of Git. And at this hackathon, I started uh, writing code to read references, which is very simple, and started reading objects. And by the next hackathon, I had done all the objects, um, all the object parsing. It was not using Prefset yet. It was just plain parsing code. And pretty soon later, I could diff objects, and I started pack files because um, a lot of tests I wrote for this tool were operating on its own Git repository initially. And then I did a fetch or did a clone or cloned it somewhere else and all the tests started failing um, because now things were packed and I didn't have code to read the packs. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of unfortunate. So I realized, oh yeah, I have to also add code to read packs. Um, later there was a command line tool. I started using pledge. I started um, to add fork and, and so on. So it took like about a year um, to get to the point where it actually had a work tree that could be, what is it doing? Oh. Ah. Um, that could actually um, be used to change files and, and, and edit them. And um, I started using this tool for my own OpenBC development um, in February this year. And it couldn't create commits yet, but it could manage local disks, which was all I needed to get going by, with mailing diffs out for review. It also couldn't handle ads and deletes yet, but um, that was okay because I knew how to work around those things and added that support pretty uh, much after that. I added um, the ability to update individual paths, thanks, based on feedback from Theo, who says that his build process pretty much requires the ability to do that. 
And in, at the general hackathon this year, um, uh, we taught uh, God how to create commit objects. And then things started to move a lot faster, as you can see. Once you have sort of like a basic tool set and all the stuff is there that you need to, to build more things on top, it just accelerates and getting all this rebasing. And uh, so basically I started with this cherry pick feature and then, then I had, merge, had file merges and then I could just do the rebases on top of that and everything just went really fast. Um, so in April, in August this year, we did a first release and we've had a lot of bug fix releases since. They've been about one or two um, per month, or even, no, no, one or per week. Um, so every couple of days I just went through uh, what people had either committed or what they had sent me and, um, or what I had done. And if there were more than four or five changes that looked useful, I just pushed out the release. And it's in the ports tree, you can get it there, and it's always up to date. So this is where we are. We have local versioning. It's useful for individual developers at this point. It's good enough to replace Git for all the regular version tasks. I only run Git now to do fetch and, and push. That's all I do with it. The next thing that we need to make this really useful is to generate pack files, because that's a prerequisite also for network traffic. And um, this, in my view, my, from my point of view, this should be in like a separate admin utility that you use to do repository administration um, and consistency checks, garbage collection. And we also need um, support for an external format of this data. So Git has what's called fast import or fast ex export streams. I never remember which one it is. That basically gives you a plain text representation of data, which is important because if, uh, if all you have is a pack file and you can't uh, dec uh, even decompress it anymore because of bit flips on the disks, then you're pretty much hosed and you, can't, you can forget about your project. And I don't want people to rely on external clones for backup. That's not a viable strategy. I think we need a way to fix broken repositories locally, um, just like Theo today is, ab is able to fix RCS files, right? And I don't want to take that away from, from people like him who really have a tight chip to run, have a lot of responsibility, and this data is really precious, and you just can't afford to lose it. So there, I'm still looking for solutions. Uh, maybe these streams that Git is writing are not entirely suitable for it. Maybe they are. I haven't really checked. Um, but if they aren't, we can just make up our own. There needs to be some kind of server. And um, one important aspect of this is that um, we don't want to use this sort of merge meister model that Linux is using. You, re you know how this works, so they, they keep pushing up changes between repositories, and there's always a person who takes care of merging changes into this repository and pushes, pushes the collection up to the next one. The problem that we have with this is that we don't want Theo to end up having to merge everything because he doesn't have the time. Um, also, that's not, the whole, that's not how the project is supposed to operate. We're supposed to operate as an equal a uh, collection of peers who have access to the entire tree. And people are allowed to change things anywhere they want. If, if they have enough review or if they follow the community process. They, nobody stops me from going into UTF-8 or wireless or even, even Relay-D or other things if I have something to fix there. And we can't require a hackathon of 70 people or 40 people on average to keep fetching changes from a server every time someone makes one commit. So we have to have a way of basically doing rebasing of changes on a server. If you've used Garrett before or tools like this, you will pretty much know how this works, um, except we can skip all the review part in such tools. They're basically code review tools that allow you to manage commits and merge them only once they're ready. We would do our review as before in an email, but um, a queuing mechanism could exist on the server that allows people to just keep adding changes and the server makes sure that, that they can actually be folded in without colliding. So you would provide um, the hashes of your base blobs and the paths that you believe these blobs exist at. And if those assumptions are no longer true, then your commit is out of date. This is pretty much how SVN and CVS do it. And so you can just emulate this um, with the queuing mechanism in Git. And you would have your changes in the main repository with different commit IDs, but it doesn't matter because they come back eventually round trip to your own repository and then you just rebase your own commits on top. And some of your local changes will just disappear in the merge. Um, this should only use encrypted communication for obvious reasons. Um, it could also be used to support a mirroring infrastructure. 
And it would also be nice to have um, a protocol speaker here that's compatible with regular Git. I don't have details in my head for this yet, but I think it would be good. Um, because then this could become an easy repository hosting solution for small setups that are secure, run maybe on your home firewall, or uh, and use OpenBSD and rely on unvalent pledge, and so on. Um, of course, we want to be able to transfer changes between repositories. Um, for pulling, it would basically uh, fetch changes and put them somewhere in a, in a reference f um, so you can access them, and perhaps even automatically rebase a branch um, that you're on in your work tree. But if it can't um, do that because of conflicts or whatever, you would have to manually rebase. Um, pushing changes should ideally be supported by the server, as I just explained. Um, Theo had this idea that um, he doesn't want to see the branches. He just wants to keep working as he does now. And I guess that's a valid, um, a valid use case. And it's also something that I guess not he would want, but other people would want too. And it's also something that Fossil is already implementing. So Fossil, by default, uh, pushes commits to more, more than one repository when you run a commit. So I thought, well, this must be possible somehow, right? We can probably do that. And so there is a good way of doing this if you only look at local changes that aren't committed yet. You can create a temporary commit object that the user doesn't see, and you use the same uh, push mechanism as you would normally uh, use to, to upload the change to the server, and once that has worked, you know that your change is in history and you can just apply it locally and you're done. And otherwise, you require a fetch. And basically then, it just you boil the command set down even further and you wouldn't have to use rebase unless you re have real conflicts. And you could just basically use the checkout commit, update commit, update workflow that people are used to from tools like CVS and SVN. This is, of course, something that would need to be added once all this other stuff is there. But I'm, in, my, in my vision, it could be something where you say, like, oh, I want this branch to say synchronize to the main server, and then the branch would operate like that. Whereas if you have other branches where you say, like, no, this one is local or this one is not synced, it's just pulling or pushing to this other server, then you wouldn't have this behavior. That's one possibility. Uh, another thing I'd like to have is a web front end that uh, it works pretty much like CVS web, so this could just be a, another front end alongside God and Tog, and it would use some existing web technologies that we have. It, Probably it, it should probably be written in C because that makes gives you easy access to the library that is already there. But I wouldn't be opposed to adding Perl bindings or something like that if people prefer uh, to have an easier time writing this kind of stuff. Okay, I'm just two minutes over, I think. Or am I three minutes under? Is it 45 or 40 minutes? 45. Good, great. All right, we have time for questions. Yeah, we have a time for, uh, for a couple of questions. If you have to come in the front. Stefan, thanks for your talk. It was quite interesting. Uh, I'm curious if you see this as a potential replacement of CVS in base for general development. Uh, not in its current state. Of course. In its current state, it's good enough for myself. I'm happy with that. It's good enough for people to try. It's just a package out of way. I would guess that we'd need a couple more years for it to mature. And um, it, it was already considered to move it to do the development of this tool in base, but there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, especially because once there is a server, I would like to use that server with this project and then having to convert back from CVS to Git, which could be done, but it's just cumbersome. So for now, it's in a separate repository that, that I maintain. Thanks. Speaking of your personal repository, is it already self-hosted? Not yet, but the server is there now. So I was waiting for folks at Inberlin to set up a server, mm -hmm. and that's been done. And now I have to find time to actually set it up. But it's going to just use standard Git tooling that, that exists on Linux. Um, if I had a server already, I would use it, but I don't. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you.